is a global distribution uh, system in the travel industry. It's behind Kayak and Expedia. It connects American Airlines with, uh, with all those websites and so on. And Verizon, those are a good example. They are not software companies, right? And they have decided to cross that bridge to be DevOps enabled organization relying on cloud platforms with open source software to become disruptors, to challenge the Uber and the, uh, the Amazon and the, uh, and the Alibaba of the world and the Google and so on and so on. And it works. And with DevOps, um, we see organizations, our customers, Canadian customers, being able to deliver better code faster with more visibility from the first line of code or actually a software developer who requests a software development environment and putting that on containers at scale in production and to win visibility. And if you think DevOps and cloud is just, it's, 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 that's the end state, it's far from being the end state. In reality, um, we've all seen <coughs> growing demand for mobile and, and if you think that mobile was complex to manage, I've talked about containers, and then IoT will be the next wave where we'll see the number of devices connected, connected multiplied by one trend. So without that foundation, it will be really hard for Canadian organizations to keep up and becoming and being the disruptor, the disruptor in their industry. Most of our customers early on were, were uh, software as a service or mm -hmm. e-commerce companies. And I think uh, you know we're, we're in a much different phase now. I think uh, we've got um, we've got a lot of folks. Uh, sort of the leading wave has gone through. Um, I think we've already seen the uh, the innovative enterprises and sort of you know what what you could call the enlightened enterprises. Those who who were lucky enough or uh, or had enough foresight to really uh, bring in uh, sort of the strategy and vision uh, as well as execution capabilities. I think now I say the majority of the market, which is still probably 90 something percent uh, globally, is sort of in this oh shit phase um, and uh, is ill prepared and, uh, and really behind the, behind the ball. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, uh, I think it's a very important time because, uh, you know, just because a small number of people have nailed it doesn't really make it easy for the rest of us. In fact, it, leads to the situation where people feel like they can read online about the success stories and think that they can emulate that, and uh, it's a big problem right now. But it's a fundamental shift that says, first of all, do I have a choice? Can I choose to do nothing? Because business as usual is easier. I think a few years ago you could have said, yeah, I'm going to wait. It's not quite there. Hype cycle says it's a little bit before that wave of disillusionment. But given that innovation is the only path forward across every industry, I need to innovate in order to survive, then the only way I innovate is by finding money. And that the only impetus towards that cost savings now is to get that money going. And you know what, what, what Ian said specifically is the largest thing holding us back is the silos and organizational structure that we built over the last 20 years to support a cost-driven organization. Well, if IT now moves towards an enabler of revenue that says the job of IT now is to say yes so that I can actually spin up those innovative projects that actually allow my company to generate revenue on its ideas faster, well, that's a much different organization than the organization that reported to the CFO whose primary mandate was to deliver the same services for a lower cost. When we start to absorb that, we say, hey, this, first of all, is a pretty interesting time to be in IT if I can actually get my organization's head around that. We're seeing a lot of companies who have now elevated the position of CIO, now maybe chief innovation officer instead of information officer, to one that now sits in the boardroom because the CEO doesn't know what to say when the board says, hey, how are we going to combat competitor X, Y, and Z? And the only person who's in a position to potentially you know, answer that question is that chief innovation officer. Number two, it means we have to look at the way in which we built this organization. And we can go down a whole discussion there, whether it's bimodal, trimodal, a blending of the such, you know, people coming together to say what's it going to take to actually get projects off the ground. Um, but we got to look there first because to Ian's point, I mean, we've lived with tools for 20 years. This tool will solve it, this box will solve it, this vendor will solve it. Nothing's going to work. They're just tools. It's about delivering outcomes and outcomes only come when I leverage tools as part of my 
process as part of my organization to actually solve for a particular issue. And I think if we take that outcome approach that says I want to lower this by X or I want to increase this by Y, and we actually carry through all the transformation and look at the end of measuring that end goal, now we drive change. But that's all about people and process. I think everybody in this room is obviously likely on the side of, we, you know, how can I get my organization to see the light and make that change? First came to Canada, you know, they were pitching managed services. And I think it scared a lot of IT people because they're going to be out of a job. So, you know, I, I, but I do, I do think that, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a move, there is a shift, and uh, the objectives of uh, the CFO now are clear. Um, you know, that they, they maybe don't need um, a department of 120 people in the IT group. You know, I, I looked at uh, one food services user that uh, we worked with, you know, and they went from 120 people to 12 in their IT department um, by, you know, making some changes in their, in their business, um, you know, both in terms, you know, they had a call center, they had a, a data center, they had, uh, you know, a disaster recovery facility. Um, but you know, I think I think we are seeing a shift uh, to, you know, maybe maybe uh, outsourcing, getting comfortable with outsourcing part of that part of that IT uh, those IT roles. He published in March of this year his fifth edition of the uh, the marketing stack, which has over 3,500 different products and SaaS products uh, along six pillars of everything that you could possibly do in a company. Talk about palettes and visualizing it. There is, it's a, it's a graphic that's 12,000 pixels wide. And you can actually zoom in and see all the different choices you have. And this is not even a, uh, this is a, 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 an I, uh, infrastructure as a service level, this is a software as a service level, this is a marketing technology. Tons of choices, more than you ever have before than saying, we're going to build on a, on a, um, on a, on a, on a mainframe. And so the, the real, um, the, the other metric that you have to be able to sort of articulate is, am I making the right choice for my business right now? And to the point of the exit strategy, it's not actually much of an exit strategy, I think, as an evolution strategy. And can I take and rip one piece out and replace it with something else? For example, the, simple, the easiest example is payment systems that have become very expensive to use, or credit card clearing, and having another choice to move something else. Well, there's about 10 of them out there. So you know, if you can actually make those choices and save some money, that's a good exit strategy for your payment system. And it's, it used to be very hard to do that. Now it's quite simple. Last week when I was actually walking down the street and I saw somebody with a t-shirt that says, there is no such thing as cloud, it is just somebody else's computer. <laughs> and I think it's true. I think that's the thing that we you know, have to remember. This cloud is not this exotic thing that's like totally different. It really is just somebody else's computer. How are you doing this? So, how do you actually secure your data? How do you actually ensure that your systems are inevitably going to fail, but actually there's redundancy and resiliency? How do you actually ensure that data is a backup, the multiple copies, so you just don't lose everything all at once? And it's really many of the same techniques. Now, where there is a bit of a difference with cloud is really, I think, uh, focusing on the service delivery models, because there's not just one cloud, but there's IAS, past and SaaS, right? You know, you're just consuming the software or you're actually using programming tools or using infrastructure. And there is all kinds of stuff about the matrix of responsibility, which level, which components, what, uh, who's responsible for ensuring continuity and so on and so forth. Pay attention to that because that's where the differences will come in. Most clouds, actually all clouds really, you cannot just have one copy, like you know, one instance is not a cloud. That's why everything has multiple zones. When you look at, Microsoft opened basically two data centers, and they really didn't announce anything until both data centers are up, both in Canada Central and Canada East in Canada. It's exactly because you really need that multiple point of redundancy in order to get the cloud. So I think these are some of the techniques, understanding that sort of granularity, understanding similarities and the differences. It's still up to you to make sure that your applications, the way you've ar architected you know, your data retention policies and so on and so forth can tolerate and can survive system failures. Uh, the two things we hear about the most are uh, loss of control and system failure. 
because I've been dealing with uh, you know Ma Bell and my old system that usually works when I pick it up and the dial tone's always there and I can reach people and, and all of that stuff. So what we try and do is we try and actually help the customers develop their own uh, set of milestones and, and GRC around their like they're starting out with their network. If they're concerned about system outages and they're consistent uh, and, and we talk about what's your network look like now, we do a number of uh, speed tests and different stuff. Like how do you manage your outage situations, what's your history of outages now uh, look like over the last couple of years, how does that impact your business. Um, by the way, you're probably going to be increasing your bandwidth anyway for all these uh, you know, BSAs or bandwidth sucking applications you're going to have on the network. So let's do it now so we're insulated here. Um, on the loss of control side, actually the argument is, uh, is, is almost the inverse in fact that a lot of the, uh, the, the well, using the cloud in, uh, in, in our products is, uh, gives them a lot of self-administration. A lot of lenses lends into their business through a, a portal that they wouldn't have before. They don't need to call us anymore to send somebody down to do anything or tell them what's going on. They can do it themselves, so there's efficiencies there. So um, they can actually set goals on or set uh, metrics on how much money they save in hours of having somebody, having Joe, you know, having to go down to the, uh, the phone room and uh, plug in cards into the old rack. And now we just do, we just have somebody sitting at the knock with uh, three or four screens just doing keystrokes and fixing that stuff. Um, so making sure that you understand who's responsible for what, it's all documented. Uh, people are aware, they're mobilized, uh, they know who to contact, uh, they, they, they know who not to contact. Like for example, the media, uh, don't, don't, you know, depending on the organization, etc. let's make sure we've got a plan in place. And, and um, that uh, uh, everyone knows what their role is and the sequence of those. Um, and then the, 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 well, that ties into the whole process of it. Thanks. So, not too long ago, the uh, personal information statute, the generally governing one across Canada, subject to substantially similar legislation in provinces, but PIPIDA, people will probably recognize that acronym. So that was amended to provide for breach notification requirements, okay, which was something that they had in the U.S. and is fairly common around the world now, and, and Canada has caught up. And so one thing you have to be concerned about is your requirements, your obligations under that legislation to notify the people whose information has been compromised of the breach. Right? So now we're into the personal information and, and privacy realm. So, so that's one thing. The other thing is that uh, any, so sorry, before I move on from that. So if you have a cloud provider, then you have to ensure that the arrangement between you and the cloud provider is such that it allows you to satisfy your legal obligation to notify, okay? And if you haven't flowed through that obligation and related obligations through to the cloud provider, then how do you then meet your legislative requirement to notify. And if the cloud provider is not willing to negotiate its terms, then you can see how you can be stuck in a position where it's going to be difficult for you to comply. Okay? Uh, but in addition to legal, there may be internal business requirements that you have adopted, whether as a best practice or otherwise, for business reasons, because you want to portray yourself and commit to a particular way of doing business between a company and its, and its customers, that even if the legislation doesn't require you to notify, you might decide to notify in any event. And there's lots of considerations that go into whether or not you do that, but that's the second branch of what might cause you to notify. And then the third thing is whatever contractual commitments that you may have made whether to customers and or to uh, your cloud provider. And again, the flow through so that everything happens seamlessly and quickly, because again, when these things happen, time is of the essence. So who gets involved in this? So everyone kind of needs to be potentially involved because who knows who's gonna first become aware of the breach. So everyone needs to understand how to minimize the potential of a breach happening, and then as soon as anyone becomes aware of it, what is the reporting structure internally, and who it gets escalated to, how quickly, and 
how that notification occurs, both on the customer side as well as the cloud provider side, right? And how that then, if it's a breach that happens at the cloud provider side, since that's this context, who then at the customer gets alerted, what steps have to be taken, and then they have to mobilize everybody. They have to mobilize legal to do the analysis, what's their exposure to third parties, to customers, what recovery do they have from the cloud service provider. They need to notify the PR department, how do we get ahead of this, social media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they need to notify HR, because maybe someone hasn't followed an internal policy, they need to be disciplined, maybe terminated. There's a whole there's a whole lot that goes on, and so that's why it's important to have a procedure, a policy, a strategy, a plan in place well before any of this happens. 